remember being 22, right? Brand new to Charlotte, North Carolina, uh, starting my career and, uh, you know, first getting my footing in adulthood, right? Um, and I had this thing on my arm. Uh, it started off as a bump, I think. Maybe, um, maybe an insect had bitten me. And then it turned into what seemed like a wart. And then it became like really, really hard, right? It was so weird. It lasted for months and months, right? So uh, one of the first things I did as an adult, as an adult uh, was go to the doctor to get this fixed, right? To get it removed, right? Um, I can still see the scar. Uh, and when I went into the doctor's office and the doctor came in, it was a black woman. I had never experienced such a thing in my life. Um, and immediately, right, <laughs> immediately there was this connection. She looked at my hair and I had this amazing sew-in. I mean, it was this bad sew-in bob, it was fire, right? And she's like, oh my gosh, where do you get your hair done? Like, can you please tell me? Because uh, I go to the gym and work out and it lifts my natural hair from my weave, you know, and I'm giving her all these tips, right? Um, and she's like, I would love to hang out. So, so clearly, right, in this uh, very nice part of town, <laughs> South Park uh, is where I lived, a very, very ritzy area. Um, clearly, neither of, I, neither of us had had these types of experiences, right? Um, but it was so amazing, I'll never forget it. Um, and it just goes back to a statistic that black female doctors make up only 2% of all physicians in the United States, only 2%, right? Um, but the experience is so memorable and imprinted in my mind because the level of empathy that was given uh, throughout that consultation, the ones that, that, that followed um, was at an all time high, right? The level of understanding and communication, like genuine communication, right? Understanding, um, my perspective, understanding questions that I needed answered, right? Understanding um, my my fears, right? And reservations around some of, some of the medical um, processes that are usually had. Um, and, you know, many would call this situation, right? This demographic underrepresented. Uh, but the truth is, <laughs> This demographic is historically excluded. It was Dr. Kelly Bogal Zobo who said, uh, this demographic is not just underrepresented, they're historically excluded. And the former is only a consequence of the latter. Precision is so, so, so important in the way that we talk about this and the way that we tell these stories because uh, it is why critical race theory is so important. We must be real about the fact that, you know, schools were not desegregated until 1954, which means it was well into the 60s, right? The 1960s that African Americans, Latinos, Native Americans were educated in wholly segregated schools and funded at rates many times lower than those that served white students. Right? We must be real about these stories, right? Many were excluded from higher education entirely. But we must be real about the fact that taking down whites only signs did not end the effects of centuries of subordination. <laughs>
I want to say thank you. Thank you for normalizing conversations around some of the most important elements of a woman's life. Uh, so I must ask you, why did you become an OBGYN and why is it important for you to put information in digestible TikTok-like formats? Yeah. So for me, ob is the one specialty that encompasses everything I love about medicine. Mm -hmm. um, you can talk to patients, you can intervene early because early like prevention is so key and just kind of have those hard to heart conversations about it. Um, so I can talk to people about how to prevent disease, how to prevent illness, but I can also intervene and talk to them about how to treat illnesses, right? Like I can have a conversation with a teenager about how to approach conversations about sex with their parents. I can talk to someone about how to start asking questions. Hey, you got a bump down there. Yeah. I, my doctor told me that we maybe, we maybe shouldn't have bumps down there. Should I take yeah. a closer look at that? But then also I can give women um, the tools to advocate for their own health, mm. right? And so I, because, and I think for me, women's health is a subject that it's, it's discussed in the media. It's mainly discussed by politicians, by men, by white men in particular, right? Like these are the people who are talking about women's health, but the, but the people who are the most impacted, women who look like me, right. we're not privy to those conversations. And so um, one of my goals when I decided I wanted to go into medicine and when I picked OB was I wanted to talk to people who looked like me, who I identified with, and kind of take away some of the mystery about medicine, explain things in a way that I would talk to my friends about them, right? Like, and be able to intervene on the behalf of people who otherwise can't intervene, like they can't really put up for themselves. Um, and so my whole goal when I started my page was, I have so many patients who ask me these questions. I have patients who ask me these questions. I have friends who ask me these questions. I have family members who ask me these questions. And one of the problems with medicine is that when people actually get, when doctors give the information in the office, we're speaking a whole other language sometimes, yeah. right? Like me using terminology that I read in textbooks is not gonna help you understand your health. Yeah. And, so, and so what happens is, it, it, cause to me it's heartbreaking when people can't really explain what happened to them in childbirth. Like I had a patient, um, maybe a couple of months ago she had had a c-section before she had no idea why she had a c-section she's like i don't know they just told me i had to have a c-section wow. that breaks my heart yep. it breaks my heart when because it what, it what it does is it continues to build distrust in the system and in my opinion that's a patient that we failed if you can't tell me why you had a procedure as as major as a c-section performed on you we failed you Yep. Right. And so my whole goal when I started the page was how can I actually create content and deliver it in a way that people can understand it? And even if they're not my patient, how can they take the information they're getting from my page and go to their doctor's office and say, well, actually, I read that um, I read that I shouldn't have green discharge or I read that it's okay for me to have white discharge and that this is not something that I have to be concerned about or I read that it's okay for me to have a vaginal delivery after a c-section I read like I, I saw from a doctor that this is okay and so it's pretty much giving people the education and the tools to be able to go and advocate for their, their own health which is something that I think women need in general but particularly black women need say that um because for black women, we walk into doctor's offices, we're not, we're not edified. Empathy and edification are experiences that we don't experience in the doctor's office, right? And for, for you to be one of very few women, right? Who are in a position of providing that in, in, the, in, the, in a medical setting, like I'm telling you, like your gift, your superpowers, your magic, man, it is huge constant. So thank you so much for what you're doing, putting it in terms we understand. Right, with examples that are relevant <laughs> to us, our experiences, you are so fire. Um, so let's let's go deeper into what you what you talk about, right? What are some of the most common lies about sex? Mm. So one of the things that comes up very often in the office, because I, I specifically ask every patient about it, is pain with sex. Mm. And you would be surprised by how how normalized it is for sex to be uncomfortable, wow. right? Like 
this is some this is sex is supposed to be something that is enjoyable for both parties and if and if it hurts it it should hurt because you want it to if yeah. you want it to hurt and that's and that's what you yeah. like that's what you want happening that's completely okay but if you can't enjoy uh, uh an activity that's supposed to be pleasurable that's not okay that's not normal yeah. and for me, I'll like I'll have patients come in the office, and it's part—it's just part of my regular questions. Hey, when was your last period? Were you using for birth control? Do you have any pain with sex? And people are like, "Oh, wait, yeah." Indeed. But I thought that was okay. I Indeed. thought that was normal. And so um, I think that's one of the biggest lies: is that sex, sex should hurt, right? Mm-hmm. Or it's okay for sex to hurt, Indeed. and that's completely false. Mm-hmm. Completely false. What I tell people all the time is, we want to identify. Why is it hurting? When did it start hurting? What position is it hurting in? How long has it been hurting? Was this just like a one-time thing? Because I'll tell, like, I think one of the things that's kind of like laughable, but it happens a lot, people get constipated. And if you're constipated, sex can hurt a lot. Like if if you, just because of the anatomy and where your vagina is and where your intestine is, if you have like hard stool back there, that can be uncomfortable. So if you tell me, well, yeah, it hurt that one time but I had a bowel movement and then afterwards it was fine, that's okay. But if you're telling me every time you have penetration, you're having you're having a lot of pain that's not okay we need to dive into that we need to talk about that we need to actually like maybe we need to do some imaging maybe you have a fibroid location that's causing the pain maybe you have endometriosis maybe you have something that is causing this and what i want to do is i want to be able to help you so that you can have pleasure you should this this shouldn't be this should not be an uncomfortable um activity the other thing i would say is that um, people think the older you get, your sex drive is supposed to go down. Like you always hear like, oh, well, you know, I'm 60 years old. I don't have sex anymore because I just don't feel like it. But that's how it is for everybody. That's also not the case. Like mm-hmm. women can have sex up like it, as much as men do, as much as they want to. And there's different changes that happen in your body that may make you not want to have sex. But it's not something that you can just chalk up to saying like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm older now. I don't want to have sex anymore. So I think that's another really common misconception that we need to kind of break the stereotype for. D, empathy and edification. Girl, you are off the chain. Um, man, and, and as you're talking, like I'm even thinking about, because I've never had a, a black OBGYN, right? So I'm even thinking about the the ease at which I can answer questions honestly, if I had someone standing in front of me that had this kind of empathy, right? Who I, I automatically feel like I can trust and communicate with, right? And and be a partner to uh, medical decision making, right? <laughs> no, uh, the the partnership, that's the key. That's the key. Like this, this, when you go to the doctor's office, it's not supposed to be your doctor t- like sitting down and just passively giving you a lecture about your health, yeah. right? Like that, that's not how it's supposed to be. Like you, this is this is a partnership. You come to me with a problem. Yep. I give you the options. We talk about it and we come up yeah. with a solution together. That's how it's supposed to be. Man, that's deep. I mean, this is this is huge. I'm, I'm honored to share space with you to talk about this. Um, so thank you so much. So um, further diving in on a different topic, right? So are at-home births safe? And what are some of the factors that folks should weigh in making the decision? So this is something that also comes up a lot. Um, and as more and more, uh, I'm going to specifically kind of talk about Black women right now, mm-hmm. but as we're hearing in the media um, about how we're dying in hospitals and yeah. some of the bad things that are happening, there's a huge distrust in the system. And what happens is that people hear, okay, well, Black women are dying in hospitals, so I'm going to give birth at home. And so what I tell people is, some people are great candidates for a home birth some people like if you if you if you are somebody who is healthy who is young who doesn't have medical problems who you're over 37 weeks you might you might be a great candidate for it but there are a couple things that you need to pay attention to for you to have the optimal home birth that you're going to have and there are some statistics that you need to know about so what i tell people is that um when when you're ha- like people who have home births, and I also need to back it up to say that the evidence that we have right now about home births 
is based on a, like a few studies that have been done. Because if you think about it, the patient population that are having home births, a lot of them don't want to be involved in research. A lot of them don't want to enroll in studies because again, their the whole goal is to have little intervention and not really have kind of like the, the um, traditional medicine aspect of it. But we do we do have a few good studies um, that are published in like in the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists kind of talks about them. And in studies that we have, we know that home births tend to be associated with twice the risk of infant death, um, about three times the risk of infant seizures, and um, about one in every three first time moms and one in every ten um, moms who had babies before are likely to get transferred. Any other thing I can I, I need to say about that, because when I give these statistics, people are like, oh, you're trying to scare me. You don't want me to have a vaginal birth, so you're trying to scare me. Like, you working for the system, right? You know, drinking the Kool-Aid, et cetera. But the, uh, the thing about it is, a lot of the worst outcomes we have for home births are home births that are not planned. Right. And I, I, and I think that's something else that's key. So what I said earlier was, if you're a good candidate, you can have better outcomes. So, but the problem is a lot of home births are not planned. So people, they're not planned and they're not attended by people who are certified midwives, mm -hmm. right? And, and I, I'm gonna say midwives because midwives are the primary people who provide home births. Mm -hmm. So if you, and when I, the, the, the part about having a certified midwife that's important is these are people who are trained for emergencies. These are people who are able to recognize when something is going wrong. And that part is key because I think that a lot of us, a lot of people, before, even before I got into my specialty, a lot of people you just hear about, oh, she had a baby, it's this beautiful experience, everything was fine, everything is okay. Childbirth is one of the, one of the most naturally dangerous times in a woman's life. Wow. Things can happen very quickly, things can change very quickly, and things can go wrong very, very quickly. And if you have someone who's a certified midwife, who knows the signs when when you're bleeding too much she knows that something's up when the heart rate is down for your baby like when your baby's heart rate is down she knows something's up when you're not progressing the way that that she, you would that yet yeah, i don't want to say you should but that would be anticipated mm -hmm. that midwife knows that something's up and so making sure that you're a good candidate and that you have a certified midwife is so important so going back to things that can um make you have a better home birth experience once you hit 30, like before, before you hit 37 weeks, if you go to your doctor's office, you're like, hey, I'm interested in a home birth. What a lot of people will tell you is that they don't necessarily offer it. But what I tell my patients is I don't offer it, but here's some people who do. Or here's some, here's some, here are some places where you can have that kind of birth experience. So you have, there are birthing centers where, and, and birthing and birthing centers, that's not quite a home birth, but those are centers where they have um, not as many interventions, but they have like what we call low risk patients who can labor there with the assistance of midwives um, under the supervision of an OB. Um, and when you're interested in a, in a home birth, you can like find a list of certified midwives. You can contact them and say, okay, I'm third, like at 37 weeks, this is what we're going to do. We're going to have this set up at home. We're going to have this set up at home. Um, you're going to be X number of miles away from the hospital. And that part is also key because we know that we know that if you're going to get transferred in an emergency, you want to be someplace close by. So you being 50 miles away from a hospital, but then get trying to give birth at home, that's dangerous. So most people probably who, have, who are good candidates for home births, it's just fine. They have their baby, things are okay. But if your baby's heart rate goes down yeah. and, you are, and you are an hour away from the hospital, that child has a high risk of dying if the heart rate is going down. However, if you're giving birth and you're, you know, five, 10 minutes away from the hospital and they can transfer you very quickly, we can intervene, we can intervene quickly and we can help save you your baby's life. There are a couple of things that are involved and it's important that when you have these conversations with your provider, with your midwife, with your doctor, whoever that is, that you find out, hey, am I, am I a good candidate for this? Are you certified to do this? How quickly can you get to do, get me to the hospital if something goes wrong? Yep. And ask questions about it. And don't just assume that, I, what I tell people is like, don't just assume that the OB doesn't want you to have a natural birth. Don't just assume that, because I want you to have the birth experience that you want to have. Amen. But I want you to be safe, because at the end of the day, we black. We already we have black. respect. 
Yeah. We, we already have risk factors. Right. Let's let's just let's just do stuff safely. Yeah, man. So uh talking about edification and empathy, everything you said just now was empowering, right? Like like because we have these these this data, right? Because we have the facts, because we understand um who makes great candidates who are you know higher risk like it empowers us to make an informed decision right and and this information can give a person increased confidence right to do what they wanted to do and just plan for it right um but it can also right uh better inform somebody that might be a higher risk so that they can make weigh the decision right more soberly right um, so all of that information is so empowering. And again, when it's coming from somebody who really does empathize with your position, right? And understands how uh, cold, right? These experiences have been in the past, right? And so proceeds with the grace and understanding as you do content. Uh, it makes all the difference in the world and it, and it clearly can save lives, right? Um, so thank you so much for that. Um, further to that point uh because you you dropped in so many gems you recently posted a quote on your page that read you know your body listen to it then speak until you're heard yep oh uh (laughs) can you unpack the meaning and sentiment behind your quote Mm -hmm. so one of the things that and so i want i want to preface this with the fact that at the end of the day i'm a black woman Say that. Right. I am a I am a doctor, but before I was a doctor, I was a black woman. Say that. So some of the same experiences that patients now that I can call like my patients have experienced in the past, I've dealt with too. Say that. And the important part, and so kind of breaking down why I decided to post that and what it means to me is you know your body. Mm-hmm. You've been in your body longer than anybody else has. So you so when something is wrong you instinctively, like you, you know it, you know something is off. Mm-hmm. And so one of the things that is frustrating and that really leads to why we don't have um, some of the optimal outcomes that we could have is not listening. Yep. When your provider is not listening. So when I say, you know, your body, right? I know that I don't usually have crazy headaches. Right. Like I'm not someone who gets like really chronic headaches, but when I have a headache that's lasting for days at a time and it's getting worse and worse and I'm, I'm seeing spots and, you know, I'm feeling like I can't move things like that. That's not normal for me. And so me going to the hospital and telling them, Hey, I'm having this really bad headache and them telling me that it's probably okay. Take some Tylenol, move on. No, no. That's not, that's, that's, that's not okay. Because I'm, I am telling you as someone who's been in my body for this period of time, that something is wrong with me. My, and, and the reason why I put that, that last part is speaking to your herd is tell people because sometimes it's unfortunate, but sometimes you have to be your biggest advocate because when people are not listening to you, if you, if you keep showing up and you keep telling people the same thing over and over again, at some point, somebody has to listen. And sometimes it just involves like, hey, I've come here three or four different times. Yeah. I know you said X, Y, and Z probably isn't happening, but what else could it be? Yeah. Have you considered that it can be anything else? And yeah. so I think the easiest example for me to use when I talk about this um, is preeclampsia. I think that's the easiest example for me to use. Now, preeclampsia can present in a whole lot of different ways, right? It's and preeclampsia is something that tr- impacts Black women more than any than a lot of other races. It's it's become a more common with other races, but impacts us a lot. And one of the more common presentations that we hear about with preeclampsia, especially when it's like a severe form of preeclampsia, is having a headache that doesn't go away. Mm-hmm. I have had patients who have come back and forth to the hot, they've gone from hospital to hospital to hospital. I had this headache. They told me that it was okay. Or I had this head, I started seeing spots. They told me it was okay. Did they ask if you were pregnant? No. Did they ask if you were recently pregnant? No. Okay. Someone who's not pregnant having a headache that doesn't go away is different than someone who's pregnant or recently had a baby and has a headache that, that doesn't go away. I've had women who have, t- like I said, gone to all these different hospitals, they finally come to our hospital and you find out they just had a baby a week ago, their blood pressure is sky high. These are people who are at a high risk of having seizures, right? So 
so she, so so this person is telling multiple people right. this is how i feel this is not normal for me. no one is listening right. and then and 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 i always tell those patients i'm proud of you for i'm proud of you for continuing to come in i'm proud of you for continuing to advocate for yourself because there are people who would say okay well that doctor said i was fine so i just went home and those are the people who see us at home mm-hmm. you know what i mean so that, that that's why it's important like you know your body yeah. tell like tell people when, when it is not right when it's not normal tell us tell us that something is up and if you feel like we're not listening find somebody who will listen or or just advocate for yourself like hey I know you said right now that probably this is not the case or this thing this one particular scenario isn't the case what is there anything else that it could be um, what what is there any and is there any way that we can test it to be sure that this is not what's happening to me or that something else is not wrong advocate for yourself i do i i actually don't really tell a lot of my doctors i'm a doctor when i go when i go to the doctor mm-hmm. because being first i'm a black woman mm-hmm. right and as much as I'm in the system, as much as I know that there are good people out there, and, and I, I actually have pretty fantastic doctors right now. I also know that if I tell you I'm a doctor, you either will listen to me more. Yeah. Or or you'll think I'm just making stuff up because I'm a doctor, so I know all the pathology, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and, and I also like to see how are you treating me when yep. you don't know what my title is. Yeah. Cause that right there is key. I shouldn't have to tell you I'm a doctor for you to listen to my complaints. If right. you listen to my concerns. I shouldn't. I shouldn't have to. You and just like just like my patients, it doesn't matter if you're a doctor or not. If you're saying something is wrong with you, say something about it. People who people who are constantly coming in for a concern, that that's not normal. I don't care what anybody says. If you come to the hospital multiple times, you come to the doctor's office multiple times for the same problem. Something's up something's up and advocate for you and that and that's the reason why education is key which is why i have the page that i have mm-hmm. you read on the page that maybe you were having these symptoms right. hey could it be could it be this that's could right. it be that that's right uh beautiful and you're making this kind of education accessible right um the myth is that we have to go you know pay a whole lot of money to qualify for access to this education right or uh, be of certain pedigrees to qualify to be in circles where these conversations are being had, but you are making critical knowledge accessible uh, to us, man. And Constance, I can't tell you enough how how grateful I am for you. I'm getting teary-eyed because I don't know, I don't know, other than you, I don't know any black OBGYN, period. I've never had one um, help me <laughs> in the doctor's office, right? Um, and to know that on any given day, you know, the things that I wonder about the most, right? And maybe not even know how to articulate, right? I, I know you're putting it out there, right? And you're giving me vocabulary, right? To to talk about the things that I'm experiencing or that I'm questioning, et cetera, which is a tool for me to go use in real life. So I thank you so much. Um, you are so honest. <laughs> You are so brilliant. Your voice is so needed in the world, Constance. Um, it's so needed in the world. Um, so before you leave, I'd like for you to set the record straight with your own for the record statement, right? And then drop the mic. Um, so now the mic is yours, sis. Uh, what is your for the record statement? So I would say for the record, Black doctors are out here. Mm. We see you, we hear you, we feel you, and we got you. Woo! That's it. Nothing else needs to be said. The mic has been <laughs> dropped. I love you deep, Constance. Thank you so, so, so much for this. Keep the same energy. Work on being better when I'm 70. Your drip is just a water spring. You know I drip different, just the seven seas. I deal with life different, make that limit squeeze. Went off for my style and identity. Better bounce back. Ernie's Williams, thank you so, so, so much for being a guest on this show, especially on the Bomb Energy Betting on Me segment. Um, everyone, I have to tell you, uh, I met our niece in a, a entrepreneur uh, community, right? An entrepreneurial community. 
And her spirit is so infectious. She always speaks from a very vulnerable, um, genuine space. Uh, I admire her so much more than she probably knows. And um, I'm just honored that she's on this show because this has incredible bomb energy. <laughs> um, we're gonna cleave to these gems that she that she drops, but um, I'll go ahead and dive right in. But welcome, Ernie. Thank you, so excited to be here. You are welcome, thank you. Um, so you're in a unique position, working at the intersection of the legal system and healthcare. You are passionate about birth and reproductive justice. You engage with healthcare providers in the political process to create policy change. You even improve medical access for marginalized communities. You're phenomenal, Ernest. <laughs> um, can you share how you arrived to this calling? Yeah, so all my life I knew I wanted to be a nurse. I grew up around my grandparents who were always in the doctor and, and healthy at times. So I've been through all of that, their process, and it wasn't a bad experience, right? So I think so much of what we see now of healthcare being a bad experience, I don't think that's always been the norm. One, it used to be that most people couldn't access healthcare. So those who did, it just, the volume wasn't there. So you had actually good experiences in quality healthcare. So I wanted to make sure that I was able to kind of pass on the amazing experiences of the nurses and doctors that treated my family to other patients, because I knew that there are things that could happen out there, but I kind of wanted to stand in the gap for the patients that I encountered. And so I went to school and I became a nurse, um, went to Howard um, for undergrad and that Howard. was really cool. nice. Yeah. And um, my dream was like, okay, I want to get out and work at Hopkins. And I ended up getting an internship there at my last year of school. And that was my first job. Mm -hmm. And once I accomplished like the biggest goal that I had, I was like, okay, what's next? Like, this was it. Like, I thought it was going to take me years before I was able to accomplish that goal. Right. Um, and so then I began to really search for what else I could do, what other things I, I was passionate about. Um, and it was a policy, but I didn't want to get just a public policy degree or an MPH or a master's in public health. I decided getting a law degree would just give me more options. It would allow me to work in policy and politics and really be able to get people to understand some of the struggles and um, just different things that people in the healthcare system endure. Um, and so I went back to Howard, went to Howard Law School um, and got my law degree, stayed in healthcare for a while because I, I couldn't figure out what I loved and then decided to create my own law practice. It took me a while to really become confident to really finally lead healthcare. But in that journey, I was able to pick up a lot of skills, meet a lot of people, learn a lot of things. And now I'm kind of able to be at a point in my career where I really understand the difficulties of the system and how we can yeah. create great things. So yeah, that's kind of how I, I got to this, where I now own my own law practice. I educate healthcare providers on how to be better practitioners and how to engage with marginalized communities and also teaching patients how to make the most and get the most out of their healthcare experience because they also have responsibilities. Um, and in that, I just find so much joy because I think that if we begin to have these courageous conversations, we can really create great change. Yeah, and I, and I think it's powerful that you serve both sides, right? The healthcare providers as well as those who are receiving healthcare. I don't, I don't at least today, right? I don't see as many people doing that. Um, and I think it's so powerful to, so that both sides get that level of expertise, right? Um, and know-how. So beautiful. And, and you've done it, right? So you've built a six-figure business in less than one year. <laughs> Congratulations. Um, can you share what factors you attribute this success to? Definitely. So I think the biggest thing is, you know, building the confidence. Like I knew that I could start a business. I knew I wanted to be an entrepreneur, but somewhere along the way, I lost my confidence. And I know, I know how that's happened, right? School, you know, if you ever failed a class, you know, if you ever failed a test, I failed the bar the first time. So all of those failures kind of piled on and I just didn't feel like I was good enough. And one of my law school classmates got into coaching last year and she was kind of just trying things out. And I was like, well, let me see what she's talking about. Like, I don't trust a lot of people on the internet, um, but I trusted her because she used to watch my baby when I was in law school. And so, I mean, how bad could it be, right? Like, why would my, someone I could trust with my child, I couldn't trust with, with my dream. Yeah. And that she learned a lot and was kind of just really showing me what she had learned. And I was like, wait, I now felt empowered to tap back into what I knew that I really wanted to do. 
Um, and originally last year I was trying to get into the tech space. And then finally I was like, you know what? Like I need to just relaunch my practice. And investing in the coaching, really putting some time and commitment behind the idea, and then also reviewing the data. So I kept, you know, I had, was starting to get clients, but a lot of people were coming for very small things. Like they wanted to do just one thing. And I'm like, okay, why? And it was really about the limitation of cost, right? I don't want any up bills. I don't want you to say you're billing me at this hourly rate, even though my hourly rate was low and I have a $5,000 bill. And so I was like, okay, a lot of people in the community have been doing flat fees and talking about flat fees, but I just hadn't quite adopted it. And so yeah. continuously investing in the education, right? And I've yeah. marketing struggles. I invested in that marketing uh, webinars was my struggle. I never heard of, or done webinars before. So I yeah. like funded courses in that. So it was really absorbing so much information. I took all of that information, set some goals. And then January, 2021, I, I changed my process to flat fees really hit the ground marketing myself being very clear about my messaging being very clear about who I serve and I my goal this year was to have 12 clients and by February I had 20 and then I was like oh okay like this is real and then I did my first webinar and I made five thousand dollars and I was like oh this is <laughs> And so that's when it hit me like, there's a need for what I'm sharing and what I'm doing. I really need to continue to find my community and my ideal client, right? Um, but in reality, people are just so surprised that I'm out there, that I exist, that there's a nurse who's a lawyer, there's a nurse who served as a travel nurse during, during COVID and understands the troubles that they have, but also understands like documentation and protecting your license is also really important. So, um, yeah, like that was really how I kind of pushed towards that six figures is just honing in on my craft and being very focused on my data. So I saw what worked, I saw what didn't work. I was offering all of these services, cut back. I was offering all of these different types of payments and plans, cut back. Like really looking, so every month I'm constantly adjusting my business and my practice to reflect the best parts of it and taking that into the next month. And then I've just continuously seen growth month over month. Yeah. So many, so many gems in that earnings, right? Uh, the el education piece, right? Um, you didn't, you didn't say, okay, in two years, I'll know enough to be dangerous, right? You were invested in education, webinars, et cetera, right? Um, the data piece is huge, right? Because as you try different things, obviously you can tell what works and what doesn't. Like you let your clients tell you, not guessing from your intuition, right? But I think the most powerful piece that as, as black women, we commonly don't lean into as much is uh, lean on your tribe, right? If, if I trust you with my baby, you know, why can't I trust you with my dream? Like that was a bar, right? Um, really tapping into people who can help us, right? People who can have five minute conversations that change the next five years of our lives, right? Um, so can, can you share with us how partnerships and collaborations have impacted your exposure and your success in entrepreneurship? Definitely. So last year around, I mean, this time I had like 300 followers on Instagram. I wow. was relaunching my practice, rebranding. And I was like, okay, like I can't tap into my friends and my family to build this business. I need to tap into the community that already exists. And somehow I like just was, you know, researching and looking at other accounts that were nursing and nursing leaders and educators and began to connect with them organically, right. just followed them, supported their posts, you know, liked and commented. And then people started seeing my name and like, wait, who are you? And then they, somebody would, they would message me and say, you're really a nurse and a lawyer? And I'm like, yeah, casual, right? Yeah. And once I tapped into that community, I ended up connecting with um, a, a nurse educator. Her name is Tiffany. We're really good friends now. And she just put me on like, and that's what I try to tell people, you failing to network because you're afraid. You're failing to network because you don't know what to say. Right. Like there was special I wasn't a, a like please help me please be my mentor please put me on it was really an organic genuine respectful relationship supporting the things that she already had going on yep. and then from there it allowed her to find out and learn more about me she put me on um we did like a live together on one of these big platforms um not even just her page but like an even bigger platform and then from there people began to plug in and then once she kind of vouched for me because of a community that she was already establishing hey. everyone was like oh you must be legit because she doesn't even right. you know <laughs> so in that that collaboration was kind of the first 
literally when I relaunched and, and kind of I think June was when I launched, but really September when I was going hard. By November of last year, I had booked like 10 podcasts. You know, people right. wanted to do articles, people wanted me to be guest bloggers, like all of those right. things were great opportunities. And so um, we are so sometimes afraid of like keeping our information to myself. People ask me questions about my business. Even if I answer your question, it doesn't mean that you can execute it. So I don't, oh, I don't feel bad about sharing about my business. I don't feel, you know, like some people are just like, oh no, you have to tap in to learn. And honestly, like until you really like, you can't do what I do. And so I don't take that from anybody, right? So I'm always willing and open to share. And people would come yeah. like, what should I do about this? Or what should I do about that? And I would just share, right? And I and I began to bring value to the community. And I began to bring value to the conversations from a different perspective. I wasn't repeating what was already out there, but actually bringing a fresh new perspective. And I'm also constantly learning. And so I'm able to also bring that additional information to that. And so people have been just kind of been able to, to work with me. And through those collaborations and those relationships, I've been able to book keynotes, right? And been able to tap into even greater levels and organizations that I would have never had access to by me knocking on the door. Um, so yeah, I think collaborations and networking are pretty much the biggest accelerators to my profession, professional career, like in my business and personally, it's always been that. That's you. I mean, to know that you have over 17,000 followers today, and last year you only had 300, like that is huge, right? Um, so that's definitely a, 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 a proven track record that you have on this, right? Um, and uh, Madi Woodard, who both of us learned from, that's actually the community, that's who curated this community that we're both a part of, uh, he dropped, uh, he's always smashing edges, right? <laughs> but he dropped a, <laughs> a quote recently that said, um, you know, if you're afraid to to offer what you know via free content, right? That means you don't know it, right? If you're gonna give everything you know in the free content you're given, that means you need to go back and learn some more, right? So I love that you keep reiterating the importance of educating yourself, right? And, and being a forever student, right? Um, because you ain't even, you, 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 you be a little too lazy if all you got are three things in your bag, right? <laughs> Um, and you can't share it. So um, I love that. I, I vouch or, or, or just second everything everything you say. Um, so you dropped a gem on your IG recently that I absolutely love. Uh, you said, trust the process, but do the damn work. Uh, that's a whole bar, sis. <laughs> um, hard work is, my, is a monumental part of the success formula, right? So in what ways do you sharpen yourself as an entrepreneur? I know you mentioned, you know, courses Etc. Um, but there, are there any you know pointed uh, tips, books, uh, you know communities to be a part of, etc. That you can share um, that you've done for yourself? Yeah, I'm always always learning. Like I think sometimes we take for granted the free information that is out there, the YouTube. We take for granted that there are free webinars. Um, my the people who answer my calls, like my phone calls, they offer free webinars multiple times a month. And if I can't attend, I register and just catch the replay. In those opportunities, I figured out how to optimize my LinkedIn for free. I've learned how new marketing skills, I've learned about new books to read. Um, and I think that's what I'm really good at, absorbing information. So yes, listening to whatever everyone else is reading, but also like if I'm not inspired by the book or I'm not inspired by the podcast, I'm going on to the next episode, right? <laughs> um, so, I listen a lot to Sleep is for Suckers, which is a really good podcast, but sometimes some of the speakers um, I don't really resonate with because I'm like, y'all hustling. Like, I do understand hustle and hustle is a part of the business, but I'm looking for people who are strategic. There's a difference between hustle and strategy, um, but their latest episode with Dawn Dixon, um, she she's strategy. Like, she's a hustler, but she's a real good strategist. And so when you learn to listen to what people are really saying, there are people who are willing to teach you a system that is going to get you the money but it's actually going to get, there are people who can teach you the strategy that will get you longevity. So what would you tell the black woman who wants to step out on her own, but is currently paralyzed by fear? I think the first thing you need to do is to look back at like your old journals, your old notes, your old books, like find that person who was super just creative and dreamy and I look back at some of the things I used to say I'm like who is that uh, yeah I'm that person oh I think from who we are right now we're saddled with doubt stress drama 
but that person is the person who you really need to tap into. I think that past person, the person who we were five, 10, even when you were a child, yeah. that's the person that really pushed you to be where you are and do what you do, but you just get lost along the way. Mm. Um, that is so powerful because it's not telling someone to go be like Oprah, you know, go be like someone else to, to do better, right? It's telling the person that what you need already resides within, right? Um, your, your best self, <laughs> right? Um, is already inside of there. Uh, just go find her again. I, I woo, that gives me chills. It is so accurate. Um, and I, I thank you so much for everything that you've shared today. So many gems. Um, I can't wait to put into practice a lot of the things that you said um, because it stretches me even further, right? The way that I'm attacking the things that I'm doing, right? Um, so thank you so much, Arnise. You are light, you are love, and I am so, so grateful to you. Lay's Business Intensive is the six-week business management course for Black women. Enroll today by going to blazebusinessintensive.com.